Welcome to FCC. You can take a quick seat. My name is Brandon. We're so glad you guys are here today worshiping with us in person. If you happen to be watching online from wherever you may be today, your living room, your bed, your car, your kitchen table, we're so glad that you are tuning in and worshiping with us today. I've got a couple quick things I want to highlight to make sure you guys are in the know about. We are going to be having a family missions trip coming up in October to Piedras Negras, Mexico in partnership with Crossroads Missions. This is something that we are very passionate about here at FCC, our missions. And uh, we have a trip that is for the entire family. And so we would love for you to be involved with that. All the information is on the screen right behind me. If you um, want to be involved with being a part of this trip, please contact Brian Myers to get signed up for it, to get all the information. There's also a way for, to sign up on the church website, fcctn.org. And um, we would love for you to be a part of that later this year. Be making preparations now for that. And then today, right after this service, we begin our first Church on the Hill service, just right up the road at 4040 Clovercroft. Obviously, you guys are here in person today, so you might not be attending that this week, but in subsequent weeks, we would love for you guys to come outside and worship with us up in the picnic area. It's going to be a great time fellowshipping together. We're really excited about this new opportunity we get to gather and worship together. If you are watching online and want to venture out, uh, we would love to have you come to Church on the Hill every Sunday moving forward at 11 a.m. We're going to go ahead and continue singing together. I want to invite you to stand. We serve an amazing God who is worthy of all of our praise. We give him all the glory today. Let's sing this together. I cast my mind to Calvary Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior on that cursed tree. His body.
You may be seated. Good to worship with you this morning, church. We're going to move into our time of communion now. We invite all of you who follow Jesus to share with us in this time of communion, including those of you who are worshiping with us from home. I want to read to you this morning those familiar words from our Lord Jesus on the night that he shared the Last Supper with his disciples. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, in this moment, we do declare your death. We declare the fact that in your death, Lord, you defeated death. That in your death, we have hope of life both now and forever. And Lord, that in your death, you show us how we are to sacrificially love one another. So God, we open our hearts to you during this time. We pray that you make us more like Jesus as we once again proclaim your death until that day when you do return. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Good morning, church family. As we transition into a time of offering, the ways to give will be up on the screen behind me. But I wanted us to take a peek into 2 Corinthians chapter 9, where Paul lays out two times in that chapter to the church at Corinth, something he thinks is super important. He has to repeat himself, and I want us to look at it today. He tells the church at Corinth, he says that God has given abundantly and generously to you so that you can give abundantly and generously to others. What's interesting about this passage is we know, and Paul lays out, that God is able to meet every one of our needs abundantly and generously. But what he's choosing to do is he's choosing to allow us to be a part of the giving. One of his primary vehicles for generosity throughout the world is us. We have that privilege. So with everything that God has given us today, let us think of it that he gives us the gift so that we can be the givers. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for being so generous to us. However much we think we have or little we think we have, we know that you have given to us so that we can give to others. God, bless these gifts today. Bless our hearts. Let us be more like you. We love you. 
We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
What if all people mattered to Jesus? What if Jesus called flawed people? What if we lived out Jesus' words? What if we loved our enemies? What if we learned to forgive? What if every Christian produced good fruit? What if Jesus is really our foundation? What if our faith was stronger? What if we could escape death? What if we could ask Jesus a question? What if we were great in God's eyes? What if we loved like Jesus? Our summer study series obviously is called What If? And we are going through the life of Christ intermittently over the years, and we're in chapter 6 and 7 right now. And we're asking with each sermon a what if question. And today we're asking, what if we loved our enemies? In fact, the verse says, but I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. And our first reaction to that is impossible. There, there's no way we can do this. How do you expect us to do this, Lord? And he tells us, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who mistreat you. Strap yourself in, people. Today, it's going to be a bumpy ride. This is hard teaching. Let's pray about it. Father, sometimes it's so comfortable to sit and to read your word and, and, and to be led by it and touched by it. But there are other times when we read your word and, and, and it's, it's challenging. It forces us to evaluate our lives and we don't like that. It places a burden to change. And today, it's hard teaching. Just open up our minds to your truth. Open up our hearts so we can apply this truth. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, 1967, the Beatles sang, all you need is love. And a lot of times we feel like that. Hey, it, it, all we have to do is love each other. But who are we talking about? Usually people who love us in return. I mean, it's easy to say as a Christian, why well, I just love everybody. But as soon as you get in the parking lot of some grocery store or the mall, you don't act like you love everybody. It's difficult. Jesus said, do good daily. <laughs> but some people don't deserve it, at least in our minds. Years ago, I was serving a church in my hometown of Lexington, Kentucky. And I was pull, turning right onto a main thoroughfare. And I looked as you're supposed to do, and there was a car, the nearest car was 100 yards away, and it was just coming out of a red light. It was safe, no problem. I turned onto the street, and in a short time, this car must have been doing 90, because they were on my bumper, hitting their horn, swerving over to the adjacent lane, and flying past me. Well, as luck would have it, the next light turned red. So I pulled up next to the car, and I looked over, and it's a teenage girl. And so through our open windows, I say, 
What's with the horn? She leaned over. She turned the music up as loud as she could. She put her hands over her ears and said, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Very mature. And I was annoyed. So I reached into the back seat and I pull out a gift from my cop brother. A Lexington police hat. Now let me say this. I was not impersonating a law enforcement officer. That would be wrong. And the statute of limitations are already up, so you can't make any phone calls. I simply was showing her my birthday gift. Her attitude totally changed. She turned down the music, and, and, and she apologized profusely. And I don't think it was the cap. I, I like to think the Holy Spirit melted her heart. But she had just ticked me off. All right, you, you look like a nice crowd. Very patient crowd in here. Raise your hand if anybody ticks you off. And remember, God's watching. <laughs> Raise your hand if it happened on the way to church today. Nah, yeah, we got a few. If you're at home, maybe you, you, you probably got ticked off possibly on the way to the computer. You know, 10 feet and you're already fighting. It happens. People just, they punch our buttons and we get upset. And then we sort of throw it away. We pass it off. I have a right to lose my temper. There are idiots out there driving. Did you see that? You would lose your temper, Lord, if you were around them. And, or it's just the way I am. You know, I blow up. And, and then it's all over with. It's just my personality. It's my DNA. It's how I was raised. It's okay. And then we come to this scripture and Jesus forbids those actions. Now in Matthew's version of this scripture, he introduces this hard teaching of Jesus with this. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And if we had been in the crowd that day, we would have said, yes Jesus, that's right and I agree with that. We should love people who love us and we should hate people who hate us. That, that's the way to live. But Jesus goes on and he commands a counter-cultural lifestyle very different from the world. We're to love our enemies. Well, how in the world do we do that? Well, you have to understand what he's saying when he says love your enemies. There's four different Greek words for love. You're very familiar with the one called agape. And this is the agape love. It has little to do with physical attraction or with human merit that you deserve to be loved. Some of you may remember or have seen the movie um, 2001 rom-com with uh, comedian actor Jack Black called Shallow How. He played a very petty man who found fault with every female he met. But amazingly, he fell in love with a 300-pound woman. But he didn't see her as she really was. Because his love for her inner beauty blinded him to reality. And when you love people, many times you're blind to their faults or even addictions which can create codependency. But agape love is not blind love. It sees everything. We see our enemies. We see their spite, their hatred, their rudeness, their cruelty, and yet we love them anyway. It is the love of the mind, not of the heart. It is a love of the will, 
None of the emotions. It is intelligent. It is purposeful. We are to seek nothing but good of another no matter what. Agape love is God's love. We are to love the way God loves. Paul wrote, while we were God's enemies, he made us his friends through the death of his son. We were the object of God's wrath and God's anger. We were ugly, we were vile, we were sinful, we cursed God, we ignored God, we disobeyed God, and yet he loved us anyway and sent his son to die for us. He agape us. He saw all our faults and he loved us in spite of those faults. And here's where it gets hard because God is now calling us to this radical lifestyle. An incredibly different value system. One in which everyone matters and everyone is loved. Now, we, we think, oh, I can't do that. Yes, you can. God said you could. But it's going to require some change. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, Paul wrote. But be transformed, there's the change, by the renewing of your mind. You're going to put your feelings aside for this one. Your mind is transformed. God's will becomes your will. You don't get to choose whom you will love. It is not selective. Everyone gets loved. We all like our little circles of affection. Family, friends, people our age, our nationality, our color, our politics, fans of the same team. We love them because they are like us and they love us in return. And what is so sad, there are many churches who follow this ungodly path, who have this kind of attitude. Hey, if you look like us and you act like us and you believe like us, you are welcome here. Which means there are other people who won't be Welcome here. And churches deal with that attitude. Bless those who curse you. Be kind to your enemies. Pray for their soul. Now, if that's not enough to shock us, Jesus illustrates how this flesh is out. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone takes your cloak... Don't stop him from taking your shirt. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Okay, if we take these verses, literally, we have to take them to extremes. If someone steals your car, go running after them, shouting, wait, I have two cars, here's the key to the other one. Okay, nobody's going to do that. If these verses are to be taken literally, then Jesus violated his own teaching. For when he was struck on the face during one of his illegal trials, he didn't turn the other cheek. He challenged them. He said, if I said something wrong, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? So what's going on here? Well, and some of you will disagree with me, but Jesus is using hyperbole here. Hyperbole is an exaggerated statement that is not to be taken literally. It's a form of humor. And Jesus used a lot of humor in his teachings. And you say, well, I've never seen that. I'm going to tell you next week. Next week we come to a section of scripture that shows the humor of Jesus and why we don't see it as humor. It is very possible that when Jesus was sharing these things, if someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to him the other, and someone takes your cloak, give him your shirt, it's possible Jesus is smiling as he is sharing this. He's trying to make a point. Maybe. It is not to be taken literally, but it is to be taken seriously. What he is telling us, this particular slap to the face was was not to create harm. It was an insult. This has nothing to do with someone stealing from you. It doesn't address pacifism 
or fighting a just war as a soldier or intervening on behalf of another or self-defense that has nothing to do with any of this. What Jesus is trying to summarize here and maybe in a playful way to his crowd then is return hate with love. Do not seek revenge. Be ready to offer forgiveness. If there is a need, try to meet it and give it your best. Not just your hand-me-downs, not just what's left over. You give your best. Sometimes you stand up for yourself. But in some circumstances, you don't. Sometimes when the need is great, you share more than is requested. And you do so without thought of repayment or reward. You do it because it's the right thing you do. And yes, some people will take advantage of you. I've been fooled like everybody else. A couple of weeks ago, Adam Grant, our discipleship minister, and I went to a Vanderbilt baseball game. And while we were walking towards the stadium, we were approached by a gentleman who said he was homeless and needed some money. Well, before I could say anything, Adam already had his wallet out and was handing the guy cash. Which annoyed me because now I'm going to have to give. (laughs) And I'm going to have to give more than he did. Now, we don't know if that guy was just feeding us a line or he was telling the truth. We don't know if we were scammed. There are people out there who are uh, unscrupulous and in their interactions with us and in the words they use. And what I tell people when they ask, do I give, do I not give? Hey, always be a good steward. Do everything you can to verify a need. But when in doubt or you don't have time or you don't have a way to find out the need, always side with agape love and generosity. Because it's better to be duped every so often than to turn someone away in need who God may have sent to you. Seek nothing but the good of others. You see, out there we hear the world teaching us, hey, you return hurt for hurt. You get them before they get you. You treat them the way they treat you. But we're not to live like that as Christians. Jesus said, do to others as you would have them do to you. What do we call that? Anybody? Golden rule. Go and say that with me. Do to others as you would have them do to you. That's our standard. We treat people the way we want to be treated. That's our measuring stick. And to make this point, Jesus Three times, ask the same question. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment... What credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. The true test is an unselfish attitude. The problem is that many of us think we're unselfish when we're not. We lie down at night and we, we say our prayers and we say, God, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. I love those who love me and I'm good to those who are good to me. And I lend to those who will pay me back. You know, come to think of it, I'm not just a good person. I'm a great person. And God says, wait, 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 wait a minute. You love those who love you. So what? You want credit for that? Even people who reject my son do that. That doesn't require faith. That doesn't require the Holy Spirit. The worst of society does that. It's called, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. That behavior does not distinguish us from the world. And Jesus said the way we live, even if we don't say a word, people ought to know that we are his, that we are Christians. We're to be different. We're to possess this radical lifestyle. 
Will you love those who don't love you back? Will you do good to those who don't treat you well? Are you prepared to give to those who cannot or will not give back to you in return? And a lot of times we, when faced with this, we say, but they don't deserve it. That's the point. That's why it's called grace. And that's the grace that we receive from God. We didn't deserve it. We didn't deserve Jesus going to the cross. We don't deserve heaven. But out of God's grace and our obedience, he grants us eternal life. So to make sure we don't, under, uh, we don't misunderstand what he's saying here, he summarizes what he expects of his followers. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful." And I, and I mentioned this before. I'll mention it again. I am very uncomfortable with these verses. And of course, you're thinking, then why do we have to study them? We could have skipped this section. And believe me, a part of me wanted to. But listen, I'm not sweating out these verses all by myself. If it's uncomfortable for me, it's going to be uncomfortable for you. This stuff's hard for me. I, I admit it. I often revert to selfishness. I often whine, Lord, I, I want to be nice to nice people. And I'll give, but I want to give to those giving people. And, and, and I am called to speak in your house, but I want to skip over these verses because they make me feel guilty and they make your people feel bad. Isn't it enough that we love you and love each other? Listen, the life of a Christian is never easy. You ever have someone tell you, oh, the Christian life, it's so easy and so wonderful, I love it. Uh, chances are they're not doing it right. Because the Christian life is always challenging. And is always hard. And Christ's words stretch our faith. And they push us out of our comfort zone. And we don't like it. And, and this is a tough one. I fail miserably at this one from time to time. Many years ago, I received a scathing email from a pastor who blamed me for him being dismissed from his church. And he said some very nasty things about me. And I immediately hit reply, and I began my angry rebuttal. And my wife knew something was up when I said, Hey, Kim, does Despicable have two eyes or just one? And she came in and she read the letter and she said, I want you to hit cancel because you're not ready to write that email. And she can be very annoying when she's right. <laughs> and so I waited a couple of days and I prayed and then I, I wrote a very calm, forgiving email. And before sending it, just to make sure, I let her read the draft. And she approved it after deleting three words. And those were my three favorite words in the email. <laughs> and I knew my actions were in line with these verses. But ashamedly, not my attitude. I didn't take into account his emotions and his feelings and what I would feel like and I would have to lash out at someone just like he did maybe and he chose me. I was innocent of what he was accusing me of but he needed to get it out. See, I wanted to do it my way. Most of us do. But those who do it Jesus' way receive a reward. It says you will be sons of the Most High. And don't misunderstand this reward. He's not, this is not about salvation. Okay, unselfish love does not save you. What he's saying is, if you live this way, the hard way, the way that's different from the world, 
it reveals who your dad is. You start looking like your heavenly father. There's a family resemblance. If you wish to make a small boy light up, especially one who reveres his father, tell him he looks like his dad. And he'll pop out his chest and he'll walk away with a huge grin because he loves his dad and he wants to be just like him. And to him, there is no greater compliment. When you love your enemies, when you love those who don't love you, when you give without thought of repayment or reward, when you pray for those who curse you, when you live an unselfish and generous life, You look like your dad. And there is no greater compliment than for people to say, you look like God. You resemble God. Perhaps no one possessed more enemies than did Abraham Lincoln in the Civil War. The South hated him. They wanted to assassinate him. His own party disagreed with many of his decisions and wouldn't stand with him. Some members of his cabinet considered him just an ignorant rail splitter who got lucky. Even some of his friends passionately disagreed with him on a consistent basis. One day one pulled him aside and chastised him for being too soft on the rebellious states that seceded from the Union even before his inauguration. And he confronted Lincoln and said, why do you insist on trying to make friends of them? You should be trying to destroy them. And history records Lincoln's famous reply. Am I not destroying my enemies when I make them my friends? Love your enemies. Do good to everyone. Be generous. Be purposeful in how you live. And you will begin to resemble your heavenly father. Your heavenly father who loves you. And you're going to be loving people the way he loves them. It's hard teaching. But I challenge you this week. Put it into practice. In somewhere, someplace, and with someone in your life. I'm going to close the service here with prayer. And I, I want you to, to, again, just focus on this hard truth. You can do this. You've got the Holy Spirit in you. You got God leading you. You can do this. Would you stand, please? If you're visiting with us, if I haven't had the chance to meet you, I would love to do that. On this side of our building, there is a meet and greet right outside the hallway and to the left if you go out the back doors. Love for you to come by and let me talk to you. Give you a gift from our church family because we are so glad that you are here. And this is going to be a year that God is going to amaze us as we move and relocate to our new property. Let me pray for you. Father, we leave here and there's a lot of us who who are going to have trouble with this hard teaching this week. And Satan wants us to fail. And maybe if we can get some actions right, the attitude will come through your Holy Spirit. But help us, challenge us, lead us, guide us, give us wisdom, and give us patience. We love you. And we want to love the way you love. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week.